Our attitudes to animals are often these days reflected in our choice of social media posts mm. and our choice of, of clicking. We, we, we used to talk to each other, now we just click on things that someone else has written or, or your friends have written. You're sitting with your friend and you're going, click, and they just wrote next to you. A weird world, weird world. But um, thinking about what you like and what you don't like, uh, I would say if you see someone interacting with a primate um, or, or, or any other exotic pet, think about what I've just been saying. That animal has been taken out of its ecosystem. Whatever it did, however big or small it was, it's no longer doing that. And instead, it's walking around in your... And as a naturalist, as a boy, of course, I was constantly bringing animals into my bedroom to study them, to watch them. And, and some of them died there. So from their point of view, I was a predator. I might be a human interested in natural history. I love animals, but the, the, the frogs or the lizards or the, the stick insects that didn't survive were no longer part of an ecosystem and ended up in, in a tank or a thing in my bedroom. And I got better at keeping them alive. And, and you know, the amateur herpetologists all over the world say, you know, but I, I'm so fascinated by snakes and reptiles. But if they're in a tank in your bedroom, eating food that you've bought from a pet shop, dead frozen mice or whatever it is you feed them, they're not in an ecosystem controlling pests. You know, what, what, do, what do snakes do for farmers? They eat mice and rats. Mm -hmm. And so you take all the snakes out to sell them to pet shops and your crop yields are going to go down because there's no one controlling the um, rice and uh, the mice and rats, <laughs> keeping the mice and rats off the rice and <laughs> other crops. Um, <laughs> so so I, I think we, we, we do need to re-examine our relationship with animals. And if you do travel on holiday, um, whether it's locally or, or internationally, and you go to a place that has animals, um, I, I would say don't. Um, certainly don't pay to have your picture taken with the animal because the animal has a miserable life, being dragged out every day to sit in somebody's lap and then be put back into a cage and, and sometimes treated abysmally so that you have that selfie. Um, there's a campaign that the Born Free Foundation did called Selfish Selfies, hashtag Selfish Selfies. Uh, that will show you lots of examples where, where people, often who would describe themselves as animal lovers. Mm -hmm. This is the irony. I love animals. I want proximity to animals. I want to stroke them and feel them and, and have my picture taken for my profile page. And if your profile page has a, a picture of an animal that is having a miserable life in captivity, what does that say about your profile to anyone who is informed to know that that's likely the case? So we can, we can influence that by being polite and asking people, you know, that, that's not, if you want a picture of, a, of a, a primate on your, don't use a pet primate. Primates are not good pets, nor are, are elephants or, or apes. And, and isn't that ironic that, that I was mentioning Damien Aspinall, Damien's dad, John Aspinall, who, who I had the pleasure of knowing, um, founded these zoos in Kent in England because he loved animals and he bought them and brought them home. So tigers and gorillas and elephants around the grounds of his um, rather large estate. And out of that personal passion, which brought animals there, his son, <laughs> Damon, is determined to put the animals back in the natural habitat. And I wonder how many other zoos that are, are looking at their role in conservation. And zoos talk a lot about the role they play in conservation. And some zoos do put some money into the field, into, into habitat conservation. But if you ask them, well, what percentage of your annual turnover goes into protecting animals in their natural habitat? And it's going to be a tiny two or three or four, maybe as much as 7% some zoos. But the rest is, is paying for a nice day out for the kids. And the animals that live in those zoos will very likely never see the natural habitat, never play the role that they evolved to play. And the message you get as you walk around the zoo is that it's OK to have these animals here because they're nice to look at. I don't know. I, I think there has to be a reassessment of the role of zoos. One possible way forward, because um, I, I know that people who work in zoos and visit zoos are people who like animals. We want them on site. We don't want to alienate them. And yet the life for the animals that are kept in zoos is, is a, a life of sensory and social deprivation compared to what they would have in the wild. Um, and I wonder how we can get around that because 
zoos exist and have done for a century and a half in some cases um, to interest people in wildlife, in animals. And we don't want to lose that. And there will always be a demand for a, a day out with the kids with a wildlife theme. So imagine going to what used to be a zoo with captive animals and you go into the same enclosures, but you're actually in the elephant house uh, or, or in, the, in the tiger exhibit. And you've got wall sized screens linking to camera traps in the animal's na natural habitat that point in two different directions. So it is as if you're standing in the middle of that location and whatever is going on there could be carried alive to the exhibit. Or if it was something that only happened at night and most people were coming in during the day, then, then you'd, you'd film the best of the previous day. But it would have an immediacy. And you see those animals in their ecosystem. And you're right, you wouldn't smell them. And you wouldn't have that proximity that, that you get, which is exciting uh, when you see an animal cl close up. But the deal for the animal would be that they would continue to play their role as gardeners of the forest or as, as uh, the predators, the apex predators in the ecosystem that, that keep the herbivores behaving in a way that, that enhances the ecosystem. And thinking in particular of, of the story of the, the Yellowstone wolves, you put the wolves back and suddenly it changes the water courses because the, the, the deer are no longer hanging around the water's edge. They leave because that's where the wolves can catch them. So they're not eroding the banks and, and destroying the, the saplings so the trees grow back on the banks. Of the, or, you know, just the presence or absence of a, an apex predator can change an ecosystem. And you don't get that when you see a lion or a tiger or, or some other animal walking around an enclosure. And so we, we, you, you look at a, a, a sign, you look at a video. And, and so you've got a live animal there and you're looking at a little video to tell you about what it should be doing in its natural habitat. Why not just cut out the middle tiger? <laughs> um, what I don't about know. the folks that argue that that zoos are a place for injured or animals that need to be rehabilitated or that can't go back into the wild? That's that, it's a it's a haven. <clears> for them. That sounds more like a sanctuary than a zoo. Mm. Uh, and and I, I'm all for that. Um, so so captive. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have animals in captivity ever. There are circumstances when it's in the animal's best interest to be looked after in captivity. But I think there should always be the option, health and other factors permitting, to put them back into the wild. And if they are kept in captivity, that animal should always have the option to not be on show if it chooses not to be on show. Because for many animals, gaze is important. Psychologically, it's quite stressful having lots of other creatures looking at you and making eye contact and making eye contact yes uh, a lot of particularly social mammals are very sensitive to direction of gaze and to be day in day out being looked at by lots of people uh, often with additional stimulation banging on the glass um, shouting throwing things it, it's not a stress-free environment and so uh, I, I'm where animals are kept in captivity I think they should be given more visual barriers more more autonomy and by autonomy i mean the, the ability to take a decision actually i want to hide behind this bush at the moment because there is a bush and in many zoo enclosures there isn't a bush or if there is a bush it's got a hot wire around it so the animal can't interact with it so anyway there's lots of ways we can make captivity better where we're stuck with it but in general i think we need to be phasing it out and using our inventiveness to create a, a, a fascinating entertaining wildlife experience that doesn't involve keeping intelligent social mammals in particular in in inadequate conditions and, and i realize that those in favor of this will say well what's inadequate define your terms and quite right but compare with the life in the wild what aspects of that life do they have in captivity and and usually it's, it's found to be lacking um, but there are some species which have been put back into the wild and are now a self-sustaining wild population. So in a few situations, that might be arguable. But the vast majority of animals in zoos are, are not endangered. They're not there for their own benefit. They're there for, for human benefit. And given what we know about the 
the reduction in number of animals, not just the species that we're losing, but the actual the, the animal biomass <laughs> that is not doing what the biosphere needs it to do to 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 be healthy. Um, I think we have to reshape our thinking, and I think this will be pushed on us. You know, one of the things that, that is is clearly happening is, is zoos are are used as a centre for environmental education. And if they've got huge energy hungry enclosures, keeping polar animals in, in warm areas or tropical animals in cold areas, um, that, that, that's gonna come into their carbon budget. And, and they're gonna to have to sort of scale that down and maybe focus on animals that actually do well in your natural surroundings. And then it's more a matter of having some natural habitat with animals living free in that habitat that people can, can come and view. And you're getting more into nature reserves with hides where you can sit and watch animals and they're not restrained. And, and that is fantastic. You watch migratory birds coming and going from wetlands. Uh, that's, a, to my mind, a much more exciting outing for kids because mm -hmm. uh, thinking again of, of the, the role they play in the ecosystem, migratory birds come in their thousands from somewhere else, bringing nutrients and then doing something in a habitat, probing the mudflats, which oxygenates it, feeding on crustaceans, whatever they're doing, and pooping, which enriches that habitat for whatever's growing there. And then they fly on to where they breed or where they spend their winter. And, and that whole cycle of nutrients around the planet that migratory species enable is, is not something most people are particularly aware of or interested in. They, they hear... Um, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what, in North America what, what the migratory birds in, in the UK, it's, it's swifts and swallows and cuckoos. We've geese. Geese, yes. They're big, big birds. They, they carry a lot of nutrients around the world. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the point I'm saying is that I think we're, we, we are due a, a rethink of our relationship with nature. Um, rebounds, earth, ecoflakes, all, all ways of, of doing that. The vicotourism, the, the virtual travel ways of, of learning about nature without impacting on it. And I think that has to be the way to go. So um, forgive me for going on for so long. Not at all. Please <laughs> you don't. Gave me don't free rain. You didn't ask me many questions. Don't didn't apologize. Get it it's been fantastic. I mean, I learned more than I'm, it's better that you speak more than I do, obviously. Right. So well, I, don't apologize. Well, um, I, thank you for, for listening. And I hope you're you're. Um, viewers and listeners find it uh, interesting too. Dur during lockdown, just let's finish on a, a positive story. Um, when, when our governments decided it was in our best interest to lock everyone in their homes and not allow them out very much, um, I decided to do, to do a daily Brighten Your Day video. So I delved into my archive um, and every day published a new video for 101 days, which is quite a strain. <laughs> so it's middle of the night trying to edit it, get it out there. Um, so 101 ways to brighten your day. Um, and then well, a year later, they, they locked us down again. So I, I did it again with mostly the same videos, a few new ones. So it's now up to about 110 ways to brighten your day. Um, all just one or two minutes, sometimes five or six, if the, the behavior is interesting. Um, no, no music, no voiceover. You have to read the words to know what you're seeing. And then just be there and listen to the sounds of nature and watch the, the animal behaving naturally. I think that's, personally, I, I, I like um, less music telling you what you're supposed to feel or think, less snap, snap, snap editing, just let the behavior unfold. And uh, it's a different kind of television, but there seems to be a market for it. People enjoy looking at it. They call it slow TV, don't they? They just feel they? That there is a phenomenon called slow TV, which um, is, is a, the antidote to the kind of the MTV generation when everything has to be fast and flashy and yeah. Um, yeah. Nature is sometimes like that, but most of the time it's, it's, it's slower. And if you want to get into that groove <laughs> and enjoy natural sounds and watch animal behavior, then uh, actually we, we've got a part of Ecoflix that does that. It's called Inspired by Nature. And, and you can just watch animal behavior um, and we want people to be inspired. So on, on the Ape Alliance website, we have a, a poetry for apes and painting for apes. So people are inspired to create uh, works of art 
I have somewhere to post them. And I'm, I'm hoping we're going to do that on, on Ecoflix too, so that it's, people can share their, their artistic endeavors, um, yeah. be it poetry or, or photography or art. Um, I have few skills in that department, but I can point a camera at things sometimes and capture interesting behavior. Well, speaking of slow TV, just getting back to that for a moment, I think it's fantastic um, because it allows people to kind of slow down a little bit, right? I mean, everything's so fast paced these days. It's a reminder to just take everything moment by moment, perhaps. It, it is. And, and, and to, you know, when someone has crafted a documentary and they've had your attention for half an hour or 45 minutes or even an hour on, on the mainstream media, the minute the credits start to roll, they shunt the credits over and it's, what's the next drama series? Or, or buy a washing machine, here's a new car. And you never have that moment of reflective thought. You've just been moved. You, you're perhaps in tears. You, you, oh, I didn't know that. What can I do? That's the moment. It's a precious moment to say to someone, well, you can find out more here. You can help this organization. You can download a report and buy a bumper sticker, organize a screening of this film in your local scout group or your, your community center. You know, that's what we, we want. We want people to act. Right. And, and that's what Ecoflix and I suspect what, what Mojo Streaming is trying to do, engage people's attention and then use it in a way that, that is constructive and helps solve the problem, which you just outlined. I don't think there should, there should never be a documentary about a problem which doesn't offer a solution and invite you to get involved. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Solution focused. Agreed. Ian, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for all of the time you spent with me today. I really it was a pleasure. It. Thank you for giving me free reign. And uh, I hope your uh, listeners didn't fall asleep. <laughs> they didn't. I'm sure they didn't. And I'm sure we'll want you back. So um, be thinking of, of what you can talk about next time already. Okay. okay? Well, and I want to hear about that about, pilot. Didn't talk about underground elephants. That's, uh, See, something that we missed already. <laughs> Ian, thank you again. Have a great one. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed my time with you. Pleasure. Lovely to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.